Welcome back, everyone. This is Chase, and joining me today is is Jameis Taylor, um, the mind behind Greater Goods. Um, thanks for taking some time. It's it's great to great to meet you finally. Likewise, likewise. Thanks for taking the time as well. I'm looking forward to this first podcast. So really, that's surprising. So it, it, yeah, yeah. First podcast. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Wow. Well, I'm I'm glad that we can be the first. I'm honored, but I'm also surprised because. Um, Really, your work for anyone who's on Instagram and who's in um, kind of in the outdoor space, I, I feel like it's, your work has has really been picking up steam and and is really taking off. And um, it really resonated with me and and kind of what we're doing here in our um, outdoor product design and development program. Um, so many of our students are passionate about sustainability, about um, just and sustainability is such a loaded word, right? And maybe yeah. we can talk yeah. a little bit about that. Um, but you know, I I know our students are passionate about making stuff that matters, not just more stuff. As you know yeah. already, we've got plenty of stuff, and I think you're yeah. you're probably swimming in it right right now in your home. Yeah. But um, you know, I think that's that's one of the things that stuck out to me is is this idea of upcycling. I feel like has really taken off more and more. Um, but um, I, you know, I, I'm curious to see where it goes and how long, you know, this is, this is something that, that people are, are interested in. We're seeing more brands that are adopting this yeah. practice of, of recrafting, you know, Patagonia has their re, is it recrafted program uh, or reworked? Oh yeah. They have their worn wear program. And, and then you've got other brands like Filson that have a, uh, kind of a, a program where they upcycle their own products into new, new items. So, curious to see how long it goes right and is it, yeah. is this something that continues but um how long, how long is the trend or is it a trend or is it here to stay is it ingrained in the production you know it's we'll see time will tell right right because that's always the concern with sustainability right is is it just something to do because it's people are demanding it and it's mm -hmm. and people want to appear to be sustainable or is it truly something that's being internalized and adopted by the brands or is it is it purely pr profit driven or uh, you know in in some cases right that that does help move things forward right um there's you know whatever the motivation is if we can get to a more sustainable place that's 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 probably a good thing but um but but things always do come in trends right and uh yeah. never want sustainability like to, to to be a trend but um, maybe we can, we can go back a little bit. Maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. We're getting deep real quick, but, um, but I thought it was, was important to at least tee up like, you know, the connection between our program and your work, especially. And so maybe you could share a little bit about, um, the background briefly. I know there's, there's plenty of articles out there. You've been covered, um, when it comes to your background, but, um, how'd you get into design? Um, okay. and then what led you to soft goods and, and textiles? Cool, yeah. So I'll start from the, the beginning-ish and I'll cut it down a bit because it's quite a, just a, a spiral of a story. But my initial passion was drawing and like sketching, illustration. You know, like every kid draws, just I didn't really stop drawing. I just carried on drawing and drawing pencils, portraits. And then, yeah, I took that a bit more serious. I like building up a portfolio of sketches. And then I just something about it just wasn't tangible enough for me it was you start with a piece of paper and you end with a piece of paper just it's got an artwork on it I just I didn't find value in it for me personally so then I started looking at woodwork and like crafting with like materials physical materials and then that's when my passion for like using old products came into play was through woodwork I would literally walk around my local area jump into skips like dive into bins, pick up like old scaffold boards or like old bits of two by four. And yeah, go home, go out with a saw, try to make cool bits of furniture. It was the way I was brought up as well in my family home, like all the furniture was just like a patchwork of like things my dad found and cut up. So like from my early ages, like since I was growing up, sustainability in that sense, upcycling has just been the norm for me. Mm. So that's where my passion came for woodwork. Uh, for studying, I then went into graphic design because it was like a, a bridge between everything. Graphic design, the course I was doing was very broad. So it gave me that freedom to try out the wood workshop, the printing, the etching. And it was just, yeah, basically a creative dream where I could try everything, could not worry about um, 
if I mess up or make a mistake, there was a tutor there to guide me. So then for my graphic design course final project in my third year, I made a coffee table. So it makes no sense, but I, it was what I enjoyed doing and my tutors thankfully understood why I was doing it and the purpose behind it. So my final piece, I made a big wooden coffee table. It was all made from found materials. Everything was hand cut. It was, it was a very like hands-on project. I avoided using laser cutters and CNC's. Everything was dremeled and hand tooled. And then that's kind of when Greater Good started. It was a woodwork project. It was all about carpentry, just making odd things here and there for neighbors and clients that found the work. And yeah, so it started off with woodwork. The Instagram was to document just products I was making. I was really into photography. So I loved like shooting my own product photography and like doing the graphics over it. It was just this merge of everything I was interested in. And then, yeah, woodwork got, I don't know, for a year or so. And then it just got very tough in the winter months. It wasn't like I had to be outdoors. I didn't have enough space. The equipment was just insane. The table saws get expensive, you need space. And in London, space is like, it's more valuable than gold at this rate, I reckon. But yeah, it was like, I just had to think of something new. So for 2019 New Year's resolution, I thought, let me just buy a sewing machine and just learn how to sew, you know. My second name's Taylor. I'm, I'm not living up to my second name here, so I need to try to learn how to sew a bit. So I bought an old, um, well, it wasn't old, it was broken. It was a Singer Heavy Duty. It's the grey sewing machine, consumer grade. And it was broken. I bought it for like half price on eBay and then fixed it quite relatively easily. And then just started to learn how to sew. And like straight away, it just felt so right. Just this gut feeling just felt like, okay, this is like, I enjoy doing this. And it was activating the same parts of my brain that woodwork was activating, this tangible hands-on, working with a machine, working with tools, but simpler almost. It was all in this compact gray sewing machine I'd got. So then yeah, I started learning how to sew for New Year's. Um, at the time I was trying to sell my old North Face jacket. This was like my first like North Face jacket. It was my prized possession, even though it was a secondhand piece from eBay. It was nothing great, but I loved it so much. Um, it was pretty wrecked. I'd worn it for years. Like it wasn't waterproof anymore. It was doing that thing where the membrane separates from the outer layer. Yeah. It wasn't great, but I wanted to sell it to make a bit of money to buy my next one. And then, yeah, I had three buyers, none of them paid. So I was still stuck with this jacket and I was like, well, I'm learning to sew. Clearly this jacket's not worth anything now, annoyingly. So I just cut it up. He made it into a tote bag. So I was learning how to make tote bags at the time because they're relatively simple in the shape. And then, yeah, I made the tote bag for myself and I was pretty pleased with it. I was like, this is a nice piece. I'm happy to use this. I like shared it on Facebook group and then it kind of just like took off from there. People loved it. People were like, oh, can you make more and all this stuff? And I'm just there like, well, I've got my tiny machine. Uh, I guess I can make you guys some. And then I was freelancing for a clothing company as a graphic designer like editing photos and then yeah they loved it and then it just kind of picked up traction from there I, I done a first collection 15 bags and it, I thought it was going to like take a while to sell out but it sold out like over the weekend so yeah it was kind of like a stumbling upon happy accident and me just being curious of like new skills so yeah that's like the the rough outline of how I came to sewing New Year's resolution is probably the best way to put it. <laughs> right. I was going to say, that's probably one of the more successful New Year's resolutions I've ever heard. Right? <laughs> Someone I actually product. stuck yeah, with it. So, yeah, I don't really. My New Year's resolution is always to read more. I just, I'm not that guy. I just don't find the time to read because I'm either sewing or like drawing. Right. Right. Well, I, I'm curious, you know, it's really interesting that you came with like the, like a, a formal education in design. Um, how, how important do you think that was for you to, you know, kind of grow up in that experience of, of being acquainted with different tools, different mediums? Like, do you think that's something that you would have done on your own? Or do you think it was helpful that you were kind of pushed into that environment where, oh, here's a variety of tools, you know, we're, we're going to kind of help, help teach you how to use some of those. And, and, and did that help? Um, I don't know, was your brain always kind of wired that way where it's like, well, I, you know, I see a tool, I kind of want to learn how to use it. I want, I want to have that hands-on experience. I want to um, use different materials. 
or do you think that's something that you kind of learned through your schooling and that's what helped prepare you for this experience with, with a sewing machine and seeing that and, and having, I guess, the self-discipline to go out and teach yourself how to do something. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a really good question. Honestly, like I still to this day think about if I didn't go to uni, would I be in the same space? Would I be yeah. doing something different? It's very hard to, to figure out, but during my first and second year, I wasn't, I wasn't engaged enough. I just, I was guessing myself, does this feel correct? I, I don't know, I wasn't enjoying the course too much. But what kept me in was actually as part of the sports club, I was captain of the badminton team. Mm. I, I love playing badminton. I'm a, I'm a badminton coach as well in my spare mm. time. So I was like, this is keeping me. I love playing badminton. Everyone was telling me, yes, wait until third year. That's when you can like really be free on what you want to create. And yeah, they were correct. Third year was like everything for me. I just geared in. I learned so much so quickly. Just being, the people around me were so good at graphic design. I just like picked up tips from them and slowly improved. So for me, that final year was where I learned everything that I learned from my course. It was a big final year. Um, I didn't actually do much woodwork at uni. Woodwork was always at home because I had free, but my course was very big. It was 200 students in the graphic design course so mm -hmm. one wood workshop to 200 students uh, students is, is chaos so I never got to use the equipment too much which is kind of sad but I was fortunate to have a shed in my garden that I built and I've got all my tools there the basic tools I've always found value in investing in yourself through equipment you know just putting aside 100 pounds or 200 dollars and then buying a sewing machine because that sewing machine can allow you to create so many things just for a small price and similar with a circular saw or like a jigsaw or a hammer it's a cost but it allows you to do so much you end up being like this gadget man who has all these tools to do different things and create different things um but looking back i think uni, uni university was good for me as in it it broadened my scope of what I could do and it did refine my graphic skills, which at the core, I think Greater Goods is more graphic on how I present things, how I edit things. It's just like a graphic chaos really, but it partners with all the other skills I learned over time. A bit of sewing, maybe a bit of woodwork. I want to do furniture in the future maybe. So it's a big melting pot, but looking back, I think uni did benefit. Right. I, I, it's just interesting to me. I, I feel like the designers that are most successful are the ones that, um, you know, they're continuing, continually learning. Um, yeah. They're continu yeah. continually pushing themselves because they're curious. They, they want to explore a new medium. They want to, they want to learn how to use that tool. Um, it, Cause it seems like if, if all you did was, was, uh, you know, stop learning as soon as you graduate, you know, when you graduate, like, I don't know, it's life's not that way. It's like, we're always continuing to learn. And, um, but, but not everyone is willing to do that. Not everyone is willing to teach themselves a new tool or teach themselves how to sew. Or I, I feel like a lot of us, it's, it's easy to come up with an excuse. It's, well, I need to go through a, a more formal program to do that, or I'm not qualified to do that. Or, um, did, did you ever psych yourself out? I mean, or were you the most disciplined um, New Year's, re you know, keeping that New Year's resolution? It, it's it's hard to get over that mental barrier, I feel like. Yeah, I, I think the whole um, thing of saying, oh, I need this before I can do this. It's I, I, I'm guilty of it, too. I do it with, um, like, I bought a new bike recently because I think it would make me a better cyclist. When in theory, it's not, you know, my legs are going to make me a better cyclist. Mm. So it, it's... I've always had that mindset and playing sports really defined that for me. Like I would always use a cheaper racket because spending loads isn't going to make me better. It's, it's me as the player. So I've taken that and applied it to everything I've done. The equipment is only as good as the user. So I, I, I feel like my friends stay on discipline, but I just have an interest of learning how to do new things and, I don't know, just not watching TV for one night and uh, allowing those two or three hours on a sewing machine will be a, a lot like long-term beneficial. I don't have any games consoles. I don't really watch TV. I'll just sew or draw instead. I just find more value from it. When I finish drawing, I feel good. When I finish watching TV and catch my reflection in the black screen, I'm like, oh no, I just wasted a couple of hours here. <laughs> Well, it seems like it's easy to get trapped um, 
especially when you're dealing with a new tool or or working on a new skill, it's it's all positive or negative reinforcement, right? It's yeah, if you have yeah. a bad experience with that tool and you can't push through it, um, right? You're that's the experience that you're going to remember, right? Yeah, but it seems like yeah, you yeah. you you crossed the line, right? Where you pushed pushed through enough yeah. that it became fulfilling. So you you can remember that feeling. Is that accurate? Like when I started on the sewing machine, uh, I was holding it and I. I couldn't do a straight line. I just physically couldn't sew in a straight line. I was like, how do people do this? Like, how do they get this like perfectly straight line? And just the more and more you do, it will slowly refine. You really do have to push past that learning stage at the beginning. Well, I guess the whole process is learning, but that initial, this is totally new to me stage. And once you get through that, you might not see the progression because you're seeing it so often. But if you get someone to look at your work now compared to what it was before they will see a huge jump and that's happened within greater goods it's been every day working on it i haven't really seen the process or like the progress but people externally have been like oh this is like really come a long way i'm like i don't know because i'm viewing it every day right yeah you're too close to it right exactly yeah i i think what you said a little uh, earlier about um your racket um, was interesting. I think so, too often we like define ourselves by the tool, right? Or we limit ourselves to, oh, well, only, only a seamstress could, could use that sewing machine, right? And I'm not one of those. We try to find too many outs for ourselves. Um, but I, I don't know if you feel this way, but I know with, with a lot of our students, uh, we try to tell them, you know, you can design with anything like pencil and paper, yeah. right? It's like, it's really inexpensive to, to create. Um, obviously if you have better tools and you learn how to use those tools, maybe it can unlock, um, mm -hmm. new opportunities for you. Right. But, but in yeah, most yeah. cases, a pencil and paper is, is what you need. Um, you know, before students go, um, too far into a design or start working in, you know, if a student's making a backpack, for example, um, sometimes we just tell them, you know, work in a material that you're comfortable with first. Yeah. Um, so take cardboard and tape and figure out what the shape of that backpack is going to be, right? And refine that way, as long as you're creating, right? As long as you're yeah, kind of yeah. activating that part of your brain and, and um, kind of doing what you, you, you can do. Um, we, I, I talked with Nicole McLaughlin about this. I'm, you know, you, you two are kind of counterparts in that way, right? Upcycling uh, counterparts. Um, and, and I don't know if you watched that interview, but you know, we, we talked a lot about, you know, anyone can cut something apart, right? Anyone yeah, can, yeah. can take a hot glue gun and assemble something. Um, maybe not everyone can, can um, assemble it in the way that you can or she can, um, but, but everyone can at least cut something apart and glue it back together, right? Yeah, and yeah. so... Say, um, uh, similar with drawing, sorry to cut you off. It's similar with drawing, like every young kid draws. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone, I have a lot of friends, when I was drawing more back in the day, um, people be like, oh, I can't draw. I'm like, you can draw. You, you just don't think you're good enough to say you can draw when any, everyone right. can. Right. It's a physical skill you're able to do. Yeah, it just, it just takes the, the practice, right? Which is the hard yeah. thing. It's that self-discipline, which I don't know where that comes from, right? Um, it's just that willpower. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, that, that gets into some psychology that, that I'm not as familiar with. I'm not really qualified to talk about. We, we would have to have someone else come on and talk about that. But uh, yeah, I don't um, know how that works in the brain. But, um, you know, I'm curious, uh, you know, maybe we can get more into the chronology of the, the you know, the project. Um, if we can call it a project, it seems much more than a project now. Um, what, so you kind of mentioned putting your work out there in the open on Facebook, like when did you start to realize that, oh, this is more than just my friends and acquaintances who are, who are saying, oh, this is cool. When did it start to, how long did it take to get beyond just your immediate circle? When did you notice that? Um, it's hard to gauge. I guess as soon as I built up a, a following through drawing on Instagram, okay. I had like 15,000 on Instagram through drawing. And that they followed me specifically for drawing. So anything else, it, it, they weren't really too interested the followers at the time, it's understandable. So then when I shared that bag on a Facebook group that was geared towards like fashion and street style and outdoor like trends, that's when they all saw that piece. It was a completely different group to what I was usually 
sharing my drawing work with. And I think at that moment, when that little Facebook post got like a couple hundred likes, and I was like, oh damn, I didn't think my first project would like resonate with people. I think in that instant then, that's when I realized, oh, this is like a thing that people like. I might just explore this a bit more and stick with sewing. I, I'd, I've, I've been drawing, doing woodwork, doing graphic design. I was like, I've got to choose one of these. I can't keep jumping around. It's impossible. I've got two arms. I don't have like a thousand limbs mm. at this point. So I was like, I need to find something I want to stick with and that I enjoy doing. And that kind of solidified sewing was going to be that centerpiece for me to focus on and then develop that and then maybe go back to woodwork and maybe go back to drawing, but through greater goods, that was gonna be my project that can bring it all together and is centered from sewing. And it was on that Facebook post basically was when I realized, oh, okay, this is probably gonna be the thing. Right. I think it's daunting to put anything that you create out in the, out in the world. It seems like you had some practice doing that, you yeah, know, obviously I, uh, with, with, yeah. with drawing. Um, yeah. was it a little nerve wracking to, to put something like that out there in, in a, in a discipline that you hadn't proven yourself in to a, to a group of people in a Facebook group that, um, I, I don't know, sometimes when, when I post something, some of my work into a group, I, I don't want to come across as like self-promotional or spammy or, you mm-hmm. know, I, you know, how did you get over that and just realize oh, I want to put this out into the world and. How did you get over some of those feelings? I know we're talking a lot about like getting over, like starting the thing, but I'm curious, it, you know, how, so how you got over that. I think just being a creative person is sharing work is so important and being blessed with something like the internet is just, it's so great. I can share work when I want to, how I want to, I can display it how I like for free. So it's kind of like, if I'm not making the most of that, then I'm wasting a big opportunity here to share my work on what I'm doing. And I'm in control of what I share. So I can, before that initial Facebook post, there was about seven other tote bags that were just on like plain cotton as I practice. So then when it got to that point with like, okay, I think this upcycled North Face, North Face bag is cool. I can share this piece and photograph it how I like. And yeah, for a design student, making the most of like Instagram and having a website is I think pretty key and it's such a good thing to develop slowly. You don't have to rush into it or make a separate account. I know a lot of design students, my friends as well, have done like separate design accounts. But whereas I found just transforming my personal account into like a little showcase of my work was a lot better. It's a lot more organic for me. Mm. And I just I don't know, I think over years of sharing work online, I just built up this um maybe like a disregard because sometimes I wouldn't even mind what people thought if I felt I liked it and I was proud of the piece and I just wanted to have it there as that almost digital archive of like okay this is what I made back in 2017 I can scroll down my feed and be like oh that's a strange thing I made years of that you know it's more of a personal thing almost and just having that archive of things I've done I think it's just nice to scroll back it's like a photo book Right. It's like the modern like photo album we flip. I don't even have photo albums anymore, sadly. So yeah. this is my like my building blocks for that. Right. Well, I I love the idea of like an Instagram is kind of a living, breathing portfolio mm-hmm. that has a built built in network to it. Um, because I know for some students who are trying to build a portfolio, it's there's a few steps that that you know if you want a potential employer to find it, right? Mm-hmm. They've got to find it, and that's really hard yeah. on on the internet, but. But with an Instagram account, um, that's something where you can you can see that people are following it. People are engaging yeah. with it more than a portfolio. And because yeah. it's constantly changing, it's evolving. Uh, it's more accessible. We talked a little bit about that off air about, you know, our archive and, and just trying to make things more accessible. You know, putting out work where people are seems to be more and more important. It's like reaching people where they're at. Um, and, you know, in social media, that's where people are, right? Um, I, I'm curious, I'm going to take another step back and, and maybe kind of tie a thread between your work. And we haven't even talked about the project necessarily. This is a lot of lead up. <laughs> but, um, you know, you mentioned um, kind of your your approach to design was was a lot of found objects. And some of that just being born out of that's just what you knew. 
you know, with, with your, was it your dad who, you yeah, know, a lot yeah. of the furniture items were, were, you know, uh, kind of cobbled together. Um, do you feel like that gives you kind of a different perspective when it comes to sustainability? It seems like when, when sustainability is all, you know, or sustainability is, is, um, born out of necessity or do, do you feel like that there's a different flavor to it when it comes from, from that kind of a place? Yeah, definitely. Because at the time it was just, it made perfect sense. You know, if I can, instead of buying a diet dining table for a couple hundred, why don't I just make it from stuff someone's thrown away? It's going to go to landfill. So I've just always had that mindset of if it's going to waste, it makes sense to use it. And that in furniture and woodwork, that is like a big core of a lot of people's work. You know, they would find salvaged wood and often the older stuff that's thrown away is a lot nicer than brand new stuff you can buy so it's finding like these hidden gems so yeah for me the the upcycling the jacket wasn't like a, a sustainable project it just made sense this jacket's going to go to waste no one wants it why don't i just use it and make it into something i'm going to use and like, i'm going to like and learn from it as well it was like a two birds of one stone i'm creating something learning and it's putting good use to the the garment that's already kind of destroyed, to be honest, and no one's going to really like it. Right. That that makes me think of something that you've said in a in a previous interview um, around sustainability being very serious sometimes, and maybe that's yeah, yeah. A, a turnoff for people. Um, yeah, yeah. And 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 your approach being more sustainability being um, how did you say it um, being. Oh. Yeah, being being the norm or being practical, um, it seems like when sustainability is, it just makes sense. That's when mm. there's the turning point, right? Yeah, yeah, um, it should just be like ingrained almost. Uh, there's this furniture designer or just like creative woodwork creator. He makes these big trolls out of wooden pallets. He's a, a Danish designer, Thomas something. But he had this quote where he just says like, it just makes sense to use old stuff and ever since that stayed in my head for years and that just rings every time I talk about sustainability it's just it just makes sense to use old stuff right well and that's where i don't want to call into question too much what what brands are doing when it when it comes to using the old stuff i'm glad that they're, they're using the old stuff i guess i just hope that it's it's not part of a cycle it, it's something that yeah. sticks right and yeah, yeah. and we won't know and you know and for a few years, but, but hopefully, you know, the, the trend that we're seeing, it becomes more than a trend when it comes yeah. to using the material that already exists. Cause as we know, there's, there's plenty out there. Um, I I'm curious, you've probably been asked this question before, but whether it's a, a piece of wood or whether it's a blank page or whether it's a jacket that you're looking at, do you, I'm, I'm curious the order of, of creation of a product. Do you look at that block of wood and, and I don't remember who said it right, but they, they look at the, the, the block of marble and they see the sculpture inside yeah, yeah. and they're just kind of chipping away at that. Um, or is it kind of the other way around? It's as you're creating something develops, like wh wh which way is it for you or is it a combination? I think it started off me seeing something and like instantly going, oh, this could work. I can like the, the marble reference you gave, like just seeing a, say in this case like a really technical jacket with a lot of details and zips I can see that and instantly map it out in my head of what goes where where I can cut where I can't cut where things can fold and that's how it initially started but slowly I'm getting into the process of finding something taking it apart say it's a jacket really taking it apart and then mapping out what I can do making the most of everything but then in reference to woodwork it was seeing something and instantly just really quickly like a couple seconds going through what i can make from it and just what works best just using a reference of what i've seen before on like online i've got like a massive folder of images of like things i like and it's split into like woodwork chairs bags clothes photography and like as soon as i save a photo it's like a mental note in my head of oh this exists so it's building up a good Developing an eye for things, I think, is key, and seeing things and how it works. And I think photography, doing a bit of photography, definitely trained that. Seeing composition and seeing how things can work differently if you view things differently or make things differently. 
so yeah it, it's a big blend of different ways of creating i'd say it seems like the other way around might be counterintuitive to the the goal of the project right if you have an idea for something that you want to make that's not taking yeah. what's in front of you right yeah, yeah. and and finding a solution for it you're kind of um you're you're looking for waste yeah rather yeah. than taking the waste that's in front of you and and making something exactly. beautiful out of it yeah so. i think i think that's the beauty of it i can want to i could plan to make something but if the materials don't allow me to do it that i've found then it's destiny that it's not meant to be that you know i think working i think upcycling working within limitations is actually so good because it gives you that guideline there's nothing nothing harder than given being given a design brief that's so open suddenly you're like mm -hmm. oh i can do this i can do that then you have all these ideas you end up doing nothing it's like when you have a, a workload that's so big you have a to-do list that's huge you look at it and you're like oh this is intimidating so you just end up doing nothing so having that limitation is so key and i think that's why i love using old products because there are limitations you know and it just keeps you on track of what you can do and what you can't do but you can still be creative within those two boundaries, that middle gray area. You can do what you like, but there's some things that are set that you can't. And yeah, I think that's been like my, one of the core reasons I like using old product. Right. What, um, I was going to, to ask you a little bit about, um, well, I guess we, just to, to give um, listeners an idea of like how this project has evolved over time. You started, you know, January 1, 2019, fast forward to now, you know, what's happened in between then? There, there's a lot of ground to cover there, but, um, you know, the project is, is you know, really started to take off. Where, where did you go from there? As soon as you saw some success, um, you know, where, where, where did you go from there? Yeah, so I think after that initial Facebook post, I worked on a bag, a collection of bags, 15, uh, just to sell to people because people wanted them and i was like okay 15 i can manage uh made that collection it sold out relatively quickly that way i was building up the instagram a bit more and just like having a, a showcase of what i can make and like how visually i want to display it and then i don't know a few more collections of tote bags and then i was like i've got all these smaller offcuts of product i'm not going to throw them in the bin because that's just against everything so i made those into different products smaller bags that are getting more and more patchworked and then this is all me learning as well so this great goods process is literally a documentation of how i'm learning and progressing so i made those just making developing new product broadening my skill set actually getting better at sewing um yeah just reinvesting any bit of money i made into new equipment um new cutting tools i only recently bought a rotary cutter Mm. Ever since then, I've been using a scalpel. I was like, wow, it changed, changed my life, the rotary cutter. Yeah. Um, yeah, just developing as I go, YouTubing, tutorials, um, like sewing room tours that people have done on YouTube, and I'm just seeing what they're using. And then, yeah, just working on new product. And then as the Instagram grew, um, brands started getting involved. So now I'm working with them to use their old products that are just completely destroyed um so yeah it's really expanded on by fabrics i'm working with a different i've done a project with story mfg recently and they're all like hand dyed cottons and fabrics and that was so nice to work on the project was so great it all the natural dyes it was different to work with it, it stained my sewing machine slightly with a black natural dye but yeah it was a uh, i'm just learning as i go honestly it's just been a, a whirlwind this past year and i'm trying to keep up with the the rate of everything definitely gonna get a bigger studio space and maybe buy some new machines or something. Right. So when this started, it was, it was kind of a passion project. Um, do yeah. you see this now as kind of your future? Like this is what you want to do yeah. you know, full time. Think, I'm assuming you're doing it more, more full time. Yeah. At the moment with lockdown, it is pretty much full time. I've got to commit everything to it at this point. Um, I see great goods as my future, but whether it turns into, I don't know, metal work three years later or like a furniture thing, who knows? But yeah, Greater Goods was, I, I developed it to be this flexible brand almost, but it's just a big passion project for me, honestly. The way I work on that first collection in 2019 is still the way I work today, just with a better set of tools, thankfully. 
So it's definitely a passion project and it's only growing and I'm adapting and learning as I go and hopefully expanding with it with my skill set and just access to materials and everything. So a crazy passion project that is in lockdown, surprisingly, has just like really picked up. At the beginning, I was very worried. I was pretty worried because obviously sports halls closed. There was no badminton. Freelance work was a myth at that point. So I just dedicated the majority of my time to sewing, building great goods. And for some reason, lockdown had a, a big impact on small designers, independent designers. Suddenly there's Primark making zero pounds in a month where secondhand platforms like Depop probably like doubled in traffic, you know? Right. So it had this really weird effect that I wasn't anticipating and it's been a fortunate opportunity for me to develop greater goods. Well, I'm, I'm curious what you think, um, you know, especially right now, um, I think consumers are just thinking a lot differently. Just in general, this was already happening, right? People wanting to purchase something that's unique, right? right? Um, something that's their own, right? That they feel like they can have and and, and it's like, it's really unique to them. Um, at the same time, you know, with, with more unemployment, you know, mm -hmm. money is tighter for, for more people right down right now during the pandemic. Um, it seems like people are a little more conscious about the types of products that they buy. Yeah. Um, and they want that thing to last longer. Um, and, and so I, I wonder if that, that's, that leads to, to people coming to you, right? They see this thing as it, it has a heart, it has a story. Um, they, you know, I, I think people want something that, that is practical and functional and yeah, everything yeah. that I've seen you create is, and I, I was going to ask about that too. It's like, why bags? Right. And it's like, cause everyone needs a bag. Everyone needs to, to yeah. carry stuff around. Um, and so it's very practical. Um, and I think people can see that, oh, this is something that I'm going to cherish and I'm going to buy fewer of this thing, but I'm going to buy one that's really good. And I'm going to, I'm going to value it for a long time. Have, have you seen some of that? And do you think that resonates with, with your work? Yeah, I think that is probably the, the reason for it. And just supporting smaller designers has mm -hmm. been like a big thing during lockdown. I think with media talking about sustainability and, yeah, just the the change of direction and more lime or sh limelight or spotlights on um, smaller designers. I think that's just really shifted everything. And yeah, you mentioned on like functionality and like practicality. That's like a massive thing for me. It's, it's again, it stems from woodwork. If something functions and works, it's a, a piece. You know, it serves its fun its, its function. And I kind of just translated that all to textiles. If it functions, it lasts then that's like the big box ticked, you know, functional for aesthetic always. So yeah, it's been a strange period to develop a craft where I just have to sit home and just sew away and hope that it resonates with people. Right. Can you speak a little bit to the power of, of a brand, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I talked a little bit with Nicole, um, mm -hmm. you know, when it, uh, about brand, cause she, she uses that quite a bit in her work um, when she's upcycling, but she's also, you know, experimented in upcycling products that don't have that brand hit, right? Because yeah. with certain brands, there's just such a loyalty and such a, you know, yeah. I, I just yeah, such yeah. an excitement for whatever they put out, you know, you're, you know, people want it. Um, you know, have you, have you seen that relationship, um, you know, with people and brand when they interact with, with your product? Cause you rely on that, um, yeah, yeah. you know, a bit, um, you know, you know, sharing that, oh, this is a North Face piece that's been reimagined. You know, what are your thoughts on, on brand and and just the power of brand yeah it's extremely powerful i still don't know the psychology behind it or why it's so strong but yeah 100 percent seen it and i reckon right from the very first bag i shared if i covered up the north face logo it probably wouldn't have done as well you know so that mm. first bag already set the tone and i don't know it maybe it's a, a thing within fashion where brand is like massive thing and it really sets aside different products where like supreme can put a tiny logo on a white air force one and suddenly the price will be more than if that logo was removed it associates it associates the value of the brand maybe but it's definitely a massive thing and it's i don't know i think i'm gonna slowly move away and, and i'm gonna experiment like nicole's done she's a really experiment of different things 
I'm hoping to do that at some point as well. But at the moment, it's like brands and outdoor brands, they really want to work on this whole upcycle side of things. So it's forcing me in that direction at times. Well, it seems like an interesting time because, you know, people, it seems like the height of brands, but also the height of when people want something that's unique and not discovered yeah. or and want to thrift. So it seems like those two ideas are are um, kind of uh, are opposed, but it seems like yeah. the height of both both of those ideas. It's like people value brand more than ever, but they also want something that no one else has. Well, opposites, aren't they? But something in between is like, okay, that, that works. I guess right. like be upcycling or like one of one bespoke pieces that you make for yourself. Right, right. So maybe there, there might be something to that. Maybe we cracked it right here. You know, I'm here in, in Utah and you're in London. <laughs> um, you know, very different places, um, in, in some ways. Um, when, it, but I, I, I think sometimes the outdoors is, is a little too limiting, right? We, we think of it as only purely, you know, the, I don't know, the, the Rocky mountains, right. Or the highest peaks. And, and I'm, I'm happy to see the industry kind of shifting, um, in a way that outdoor isn't necessarily just camping, climbing, hiking. Um, the outdoor industry is, going to the park or it's more focused on the activity, less, yeah. less about um, where you're doing it. And that's where I, I see, I, I, sometimes I don't like using outdoor. I, I just like focusing on activity and that's yeah. where badminton, right? I yeah, think yeah. it's within the umbrella in, in my opinion, but I'm curious kind of your relationship with, with the outdoors in, in that way. Yeah, that's such a good point. Like when I think of Utah outdoors, it's very different to London outdoors, you know? I dream of Utah outdoors and being in London, but it's like, yeah, for me, outdoors is like just being out the house, being on a bike, going to the park or going for a walk. That is like the things that I live for in London. You know, I, I wish we had more greenery. Well, London gets a bad rep of being like very built up and urban, but we do have some nice parks weirdly. So there are some hidden gems and yeah, I think that, and in lockdown as well, being outdoors, it's been like a, a massive thing and getting people out of the house. At the beginning, everyone was running. Literally, my local area was just a bunch of runners and cyclists. So buying a bike online was the mission. But yeah, it's, I'm glad it's uh, shifting towards that way. And yeah, I've seen a big surge of that kind of different approach to the outdoors. I recently joined a bird watching group. So mm -hmm. now every month we would go to a park and do some bird watching. So that's been another thing I'm trying to learn. And it gives that, it's that little add-on to being outdoors. Like when I go for a walk now, I'm interested in the wildlife a lot more. And yeah, it's just, I'm glad to see the outdoor perception being changed, expanding beyond huge national parks and just meaning being outside of four brick walls. Right. It seems like a much more sustainable approach, right? Because then it becomes yeah. a daily a daily practice right rather than you, you can't live at the national parks you can't go there every day um but you can go out your front door every day um in most yeah. cases um I, you know we we have um here in our community um at the county level um we we have a um we have someone whose job is to build trail systems and build out a master plan um for for the trail system here in our community and and you know sometimes the the, uh, the trail system is separate from the transportation plan that happens right. in, in the city and, and and in some cases it's okay trails are in the mountains you know we, bike lanes are are in the community and and this individual who was our trails planner I, I really liked his approach it was we need to blend those because the trail starts out your front door even if it's your sidewalk that's a trail. Um, yeah. so again, kind of rethinking, you know, what is a trail? What is the outdoors? Um, I, I, I like that things are starting to shift. There's probably so much more that can be done, but it seems like a shift is happening, you know, to make the outdoors, you know, make that umbrella a little bit bigger, um, which I love, but, yeah, definitely. um, kind of back, back to product a little bit. I'm curious. Um, I know you've expressed interest in, in doing apparel, um, but but what has it been about carrying you know products that that carry bags totes bottle bags you know what is it about um carrying that has been interesting to you is, is it the function of those items it's 100 percent the function like i'm tote bag users are, or tote bags are very powerful like polarizing people either use them a lot 
or just like we'll never go near one. I was one of the guys that use them quite often just because they're convenient. I'd walk to the shops, do the local shop, have like three, because I don't drive either, so I'm walking everywhere cycling. So I'd have like three tote bags just full of grocery goods. So that's why I made the tote bag for myself, is I'm going to use this a lot, you know, and if it breaks, great, I can repair it. So for me, it's the function. And also the big IKEA bags, mm -hmm. they are so good. Honestly, I use those so much. Just the other day, I, I bought some like small cabinets and I used two IKEA bags to lug them back. Mm. So yeah, just um, the function of how like easy they are to use a tote bag is like, it's the simplest form, you know, it carries stuff, it's comfortable. You can put a single strap over it, it becomes a messenger. So yeah, the function for me is everything. If it's something I'm going to use or it has a purpose, then that ticks the box for me. And that's the issue I had with drawing. It never had a function. It was visually nice, it was cool, but aesthetics were always second for me. It was always function. And that's why I loved woodwork. Someone's gonna sit on this chair and like use it. And it's it loses this like um just aesthetic, like holy value where it just looks good. You you just gotta appreciate it. But I like to think that my bags are being heavily used, taken to every park trip, getting covered in mud, you know. Uh just something that provides a function for someone, makes someone's life easier, or just makes their weekly shop a lot better because they can carry stuff. That's kind of like what I live for. I, well, everything I've done has been from what I found a need for myself. So it's kind of selfish in a way. I've made a tote bag for myself and it's expanded and people resonated. I used to do woodwork for myself, make a bedside table, and people saw that online and said, oh, I need one as well. So it's kind of like a weird pet personal passion project in a sense. Have you, have you seen any of your product in the wild? I, I know a lot of your yeah. product probably goes, goes all over the world, right? But yeah. is there, was there a time that you saw one in the wild and, and you didn't know the person? Yeah, honestly, this is like last week and I, I guess it counts, but see what you think. I went on the bird watching walk. Uh, I don't know how long it took, a couple of weeks maybe. And then we were all there going for a walk. And then when I came home, a day later, we have a big WhatsApp group with everyone. I saw the photos in the group. And then some, one, of the, one of the people were wearing one of my bottle bags. Mm. I'm thinking, I didn't see him wear that. Like, I didn't see him wear that on the day. So I've seen someone in the wild wear one of my bags, but I saw it via like whatsapp so i don't know if that right. counts. <laughs> i think it does yeah it definitely does <laughs> yeah. because the feeling is there what what was the feeling for you ah it was that. strange because i that's the first time that's ever happened and i remember starting great goods thinking imagine i see someone on the train wearing something i've made with my hands like physically created and they've purchased it and actually using the product and uh, back then thinking about it it just blew my mind I was like yeah that's it that's like I'm sorted I can just give up everything at that point you know I'm done but then weirdly it didn't affect me too much I saw it and I was like that's pretty cool and then that was it and then on to the next yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah you, you didn't let it get to your head I, yeah I, I've honestly I think I've become a bit numb to like yeah. celebrating small wins you know and it's quite sad sometimes my friends will be like yeah, you've got to celebrate your collection selling out, you know? I'm like, well, that's, I'm working on all the other stuff, you know? It doesn't stop. It's like a, a continuous train. If, if I slow down, then it just jeopardizes so many projects. So it's, you get really caught up with it. And I think having breaks is very important because that's another negative with on, really like the only negative for me personally with online stuff is that it only shows the end product. It only shows the finished piece. It only shows... I don't know, the, the final products, the lookbook or whatever, but everything behind the Instagram post is like the graph and the hard work or all the emailing, all the editing, all the photographing. So it's, it's good and bad in that sense. But yeah, I could talk all day about that. Yeah. Are, are you trying to do more to be able to tell that story and communicate that? Or, or are you yeah. just hoping on opportunities like this and the interviews that you do to kind of show people you know the, the behind the scenes or are you trying to do some more of that personally to give people an idea of you know what goes into creating the product i'd like to think i'm trying to do that personally but it's very hard like when i start making and sewing i'm doing that all day like laser focused on the machine 
and for me to set up a camera and document it is very tricky. So I yeah. really rely on these podcasts and interviews to gain an insight on how it works or how small Great Goods is. A lot of people think it's a massive team or like, I've had people apply for internships. I'm like, <laughs> I'm the intern, you're talking to the intern. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's tricky, it's, it's hard to keep it transparent. Weirdly, it's hard to be transparent, which is should be or not like an organic thing, but it's right. with the online, it's very hard. Well, I imagine, you know, trying to set up a camera and get that shot, it would takes you out of it in a way, right? And then it yeah. doesn't it th- then it doesn't feel authentic anymore. I've done it once once or twice before and I'd finished it and like took like a deep breath. I was like, wow, that took a long time. That was a lot of hard work. Because yeah. I'm not a filmmaker, I'm not really good at documenting in that sense. I like doing the finished product stuff. So maybe if I had a friend to help me out on that kind of end, then yeah, it would work. But I think interviews and podcasts like this have such a deeper insight mm-hmm. and people that do want to listen to it and understand will definitely like engage with it so right yeah it's a strange one right well you know i i don't want to take too much of your time um this is fun for me just just to talk to you and get get a glimpse into what you're doing but i i didn't even touch on the name really um but maybe that's a good place to kind of wrap it up i i'm sure there's multiple meanings to the, you know greater goods that that i can see right making product for the greater good you know yeah. all of us everyone you know making greater product um you know are though we're, i'm assuming that was a conscious decision are, are there other meanings to, to, yeah. to the name that was the the general drift gist of it and it was remember great goods was woodwork so it was all like furniture related so it had to sound like not classy but just like a good ring to it in a sense and but it made it flexible so say if I stopped doing furniture and I oh weirdly go into sewing it would still like work and right. that was like a big thing for me I, I was I could have just named it after myself and just called it Jameis but I never wanted it to be about just me I wanted to to be about the work and stripping my name from it kind of helped with that. Where do you see the future? Um, you know, what gets you out of bed, you know, doing this every day? I imagine it's a constant challenge, which has got to be invigorating yeah. where the materials you're working with are always different. Um, yeah. Is that what continues to drive you? And, and where do you think that's going to lead? Uh, I think long-term goal for me is just to, again, expand my skill set even more. I do want to do furniture pieces within the greater goods now. Now it is bigger than it was before merging what I'm doing with outdoor gear with furniture and a range of products would be cool. I don't have like a set in stone long-term plan. I'm, I've learned that being flexible and adapting is key. I can have a, a plan for next month, but maybe one email comes up about a project that will throw my one month like plan or goal out the window. So yeah, just seeing how it goes. COVID might pop up again, so I'm going to have to adapt even more. Everyone will have to adapt. So, yeah, a long-term plan is not my strong point. So see how it goes. Like, what gets me up in the morning is just knowing I have to work on certain projects and keep them going. And when there's a quiet point, that's when I'll experiment with something new and just go back to how it was before and just be um, excited about learning a new skill. Well, was I, I was going to ask this earlier. I'll, I'll ask it now as kind of as a final question, but do you have any outlets? I mean, badminton was one of those, but but yeah. we don't have that right now. Um, what are you that's doing to, to, I mean, do you have an outlet outside of work? Something that's keeping you yeah. sane? I think if I didn't, I would be insane by now. I probably wouldn't be sleeping. But I, yeah, cycling and going on walks and runs is I go to. Bought a new bike yesterday, so I've been enjoying that. But yeah, go, being outdoors gang outside these four walls that's good well i'm glad that you can and you can do it safely i'm glad you're doing well and you're safe and and things are good with you all things Likewise. considered um but what you know if people want to stay in touch with you is it greater good greater dot goods on instagram yeah, instagram's greater dot goods and the website is greater goods dot online but everything's yeah. on instagram nowadays yeah it is that's the place okay <laughs> well Thanks for taking time. It's it's great to talk to you. It's great to see you and and uh, really enjoyed the conversation. We'll maybe we'll do a part two at some point because this was yeah. fun. That would yeah. be really good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank Thanks you. So